Hey everyone, what up? Matt Kaiser here. And it's finally time. Finally time to put my mana journey to a close. I'm very sorry for the long ass wait here, but hey, it's better late than never, am I right? But alas, it's time. Time to finally wrap my so-called mana binge to a close. And that ends with Visions of Mana. Now, Visions of Mana is the latest and newest mainline mana game, released in, well, over a decade now, since the release of, well, Dawn of Mana for the PS2 in 2006. And after the critical and commercial success of Trials of Mana Remake, as well as the whole collection of Mana trilogy on the Switch, interest for the series was reignited and peaked. And back in 2022, a brand new Mana game was teased, and only during the Game Awards around 2023, as well as a trademark, we finally got a brand new Mana game in the form of Visions of Mana. That announcement alone blew everyone away. Now, Visions of Mana was being developed by Oka Studios and Square Enix serving as the publisher. Having a mix of the main core Mana team, like series producer Masaru Oyamada, as well as creator and character designer Koichi Ishii, and you also have new players on the board, like director of this game being Ryosuke Yoshida, out of former Devil May Cry fame involved. This game set out to be a brand new direction and evolution of the Mario series, with having starting graphics and environments, as well as new additions and mechanics, but still retaining the core elements that keep the general identity of the Mario series. This game was released on August 29th for PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Xbox Series and PC via Steam. And I'll be looking into the PS5 version and ask myself, is this truly the minor game that we've been waiting for? Is this the ultimate combination of the series? Well, we'll find out soon enough. But before we begin, if you like what you've seen here, by all means, like the video, click the subscribe button if you're new, and hit that bell notification icon if you want more RPG reviews like this from yours truly. And with that said, let's get back to the video. And without further ado, let's dance, ride on a pickle, and head to the mana tree as we head straight into Visions of Mana. So the story takes place in Quidel where in the world is in constant needs of preserving life and mana throughout the whole world. As well, through the will of the mana goddess, the fairy and the elemental spirits will set out to find people around the continents and choose them as the arms of their respective element, among also soul guards to protect them throughout the journey to the mana tree, where they will sacrifice their lives to said mana tree in order to continue balance within the mana of this world. The latest soul guard appointed is Val, who hails from the fire continent of Tiania, and he set out to escort his childhood friend, who is now the arm of fire, being, well, Hina. Together, they set out to go and find the remaining chosen arms and take them to the mana tree. However, along the way, they will cover dangerous obstacles, make new friends, and discover a horrifying truth that will even change the perception of life and things. And that is the story, and overall, I actually enjoy this one. Now sure, I'm not certain that this will be like the best narrative of this year, especially when you have things like say Metal with Fantasio, or even maybe even Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and like the Dragon Infinite Wealth. And yes, I am aware those two games have their own contentious side for things, whether or not they're good stories or not. But even with that said, I was still amazed by the story on how well it was told. It has some interesting themes and just, well, generally fleshed out and nuanced characters. Now, on the basis, it's similar to the likes of, say, Final Fantasy X and Tales of Symphonia, with the main hero being chosen to serve as basically a vessel while our main actual hero is the protector, going out for a long journey. But what's really captivating about the story is having a recurring trope that's played throughout the Mars series, that being sacrifice, and how that is the main 
focus of this game's story, and how some characters do reflect upon that, and even take it into question really, about the ideas of still having so much to do in life, despite the responsibility and tradition that's embarked, and however, there will be grave consequences if that tradition is not carried, with things like say, if you don't sacrifice the arms, the continent will be, you know, destroyed. Not only that, but I was really amazed on how much they span a really good twist on this particular trope. The world building is strong in this game as it was in previous Mario titles, which makes me enriched in this world and immersed. Help that there's also a good chunk of lore and races within this world. A lot of care and development goes throughout the main cast of characters, which really cements this amazing story, as they are some of the most well-written characters throughout the whole series, all of them having their own personalities, motives that you can relate to and feel for, as well as having constant back and forth banter that makes them feel like both friends and a sense family, which is really good. Now don't get me wrong, the past minor games had some really good characters, even if some do lean heavily towards their standard tropes, but the way it's handled in Visions is really good, as it's mostly a character driven journey here, with each of the characters in this game having their time to shine. Now let's start with Val. Now he's sort of similar on paper to other protagonists like Randy, where he's kind and caring as well as jovial towards Hina, but Later on, when he discovers one dramatic moment, as well as one big major revelation, he then understandably gets broken and torn down by this heavy burden, and through the help of the others and reassurance that he is able to find new meaning towards his newfound life, and does whatever he can to overcome his newfound destiny. And he easily, easily is the best Redhead protagonist of the Mars series? By default, really. I mean, if we were going to count against all the protagonists in Charles Minor, well, you have a hard time competing against, well, Angela. But overall, really great character. And then we have Hina, who's also enjoyable and plays off with Val and has some strong feelings towards him. And when she's. and while she's fine with her newfound role, she obviously second guesses about that role and thinks about what she could be doing in life, especially when she goes out of her own village. Honestly, she's a really cute character. And then of course we have Karina, Morley, Jule, and best girl Palomina. Sorry, a bit ahead of myself there. Let's start with Karina. Now she is often the brash type and she's given on how much shade she's get from her people due to her attitude and how she's the only dragon folk with only one wing due to an accident she had in the past. And the only people that looked out for her was Ramko, who's a baby dragon, and Shiryu, her boyfriend. Though later down the line, she becomes less bratty and is more nicer, especially with her newfound role as an arm. And she even gets a moment to herself to even shine, but still has a little bit of that brightness that makes for some really good banter and decent jokes, especially Jule. Then we have Morley, who's another great character, and he's burdened by tragedy, where he lost his own people in a term after an accident including his mother, especially when he believes that tragedy was his own fault, making him probably the most tragic character in the entire game. The one. I would also say had the most emotional attachment to, with the only one that raised him as a kid being a familiar face of sorts. But after his newfound responsibility as an arm, he puts that fear and guilt to rest, and has new friends, and becomes more happy as a result, and more jovial and honestly a compelling character regardless. He also has an emotional moment that really hit me in the gut. Then we have Best Waifu Palomina. I'm sorry, but again, I'm also not sorry. This rather beautiful queen from the kingdom of Elstana, who's burdened by a newfound responsibility as an arm, which would mean leaving her kingdom to her younger brother, who she feels is not ready to rule, among also the fact that we have a shady figure within them 
was trying to take the kingdom for himself. However, once that plot thread is settled, she's much more calmer and easily one of the most notable characters in the series. Though later down the line, her notion of wanting to continue her journey but also question to join her brother and spend time with him is challenged. And then lastly, we have Jule, a little kid who makes nice songs and cares for his little sparkling friends. And while at first he may act a little bit busy and rude, he does become more friendly. And honestly, he makes some really funny remarks when he joins the group. Also, without personal feeling, he's my son and I will protect him with my life. Protect this little kid at all costs. I've only had Arlo for a day and a half, but if anything happened to him, I would kill everyone in this room and then myself. Overall, the main cast of this game is easily the best written of the entire Mario series. The side characters in this game are also enjoyable, with some familiar new faces, like Niccolo, though he's a rabbit but not a cat, as well as Ian and especially Aish. As for the villains, well there's two of them in fact, and for what they're going for, I thought they were really mostly well handled, as they serve as mostly just solid tragic characters that do parallel against our main hero, which was a nice and welcome change of pace. Given that prior mana villains were simply just evil, some love to hate kind of evil, but still evil. But the antagonists here really make me do feel and understand what they're going for. Even if some of the parts of the writing that they do have could have used a little bit of refinement in the work, but and it could have overall just made them from either pretty good tier to top tier villains. But eh, I'll take what I can get here. Generally, the characters in this game are really good, and mostly it's thanks to solid voice work, which I'll say right here and now, is leagues better than Charles and Minor Remake, with everyone giving a mostly good performance. Minus a few odd moments where you do have some weird line deliveries here that do borderline cheesy and sometimes a little stilted. But, but, it's not as bad as, say, Sharwitz. I'm sorry. Things like Stephen Fu as Val, KG Tang as Morley, and even Vanessa Lemonidas as Palomina be my favorites. And I know while some people do take issue with Karina's southern accent, it's not honestly that bad. Again, it could be a lot worse, mind you. Now, sure, the story isn't perfect as there were some pacing issues, and again, some of the writing of the villains could have used a little bit more time in the oven, but overall, the story in this game, I really, really loved. Now when it comes to the visuals, good golly gorgeous, this game is, well, gorgeous. Now, Charles of Mana Remake was already a nice looking game, especially for, well, a budget remake here. But this game immediately blows Charles of Mana Remake out of the water here, with some truly impressive visuals. Both the environments here, especially the cat designs, the locales, and the general art style is a massive glow up, and easily it's the best looking Mana game out of the lot. Honestly, this game even gives me vibes with games like Dragon Quest XI, Kingdom Hearts 3, Granblue Fantasy Relink, and Tales of Arise. And all of those games look so beautiful as well. The color variety is really strong here, and you just get stunning locations, especially the town of Ilistana, which looks phenomenal in both daytime and nighttime. They really took the visual style that was introduced in the original Secret of Mana, and really amped it up all the way to 11, and fully give it a real general realization in 3D. I was really enamored by this game's visuals, and it gives me a sense of what Final Fantasy IX would look like in today's graphics. I know we also have the memorial project and the potential remake, but shh. The main character designs with the classes and the monster designs are all really great. And the same goes with the character designs that just generally enrich this overall fantastic 
and cozy environmental fantasy world. It's just so damn amazing. Now sure, it's not entirely perfect, as you do have the occasional stiff character animations where characters would stand still and talk stiff, with few of them seem just well stilted. Not help that some of them just open their eyes without much expression. And not gonna lie, it's a little bit jarring. Though that's really expected, especially for a game that's not, say, triple A in a sense. In a comparison though, we do have really amazing animated and mocap cutscenes that really have a surprisingly good amount of choreography and action, especially for a game like this. I was actually surprised by on how smooth this action goes through. The UI is also pretty good, except for the fact that the text is also small. Like why? First Star Ocean 6 and now this? Now overall, I played this game on PS5, and performance wise I mostly got a 60 FPS, doing some exploration and general battles. However, unfortunately, it's kinda all over the place, especially doing certain places when exploring. Hell, and even cutscenes. As some cutscenes, even the best looking ones, run around at 30 FPS or even lower, and that alone is jarring. There are some few cutscenes that do run at 60 FPS, but mainly the stiff cutscenes here. I also heard it's not entirely great on PC, and I heard it's even worse on last gen consoles. I would hope that there will be some patches that will be made up for it, but given recent news, it's sort of up in the air. And don't worry, we'll get there soon enough. But aside from those performance issues, the game itself still looks really great. And then, we go on to the meat of the game. So just like with the other Mana games, Visions of Mana is a real-time action RPG. Now similar to like say the remake of Trials of Mana, you have your standard attack that does perform a good amount of combos, among also a special attack to mix with those combos. And you also have a dodge, though here it's more of a dash than say a dodge roll, and you have a jump. However, that's immediately when the similarities end as Vigilance takes a whole new aspects to a whole brand new level, like having a double jump and aerial dash, allowing for the first time in the series to have fully aerial combat. The class strike has also been overhauled, and it serves as basically a super, where if you deal or take damage, that bar is raised to 100, and depending on who you pick, that character's class strike is used to perform a powerful devastating attack to nearby enemies and bosses. The ring menu also works as you would expect, where you get to pause and cycle to use items, magic, whether it's for you or your party members, and heck, you can even use some of the magic in the air even, among also saying those shortcuts, so it's able to activate them on the fly. On top of also having switching characters mid-battle, but another exciting thing is that the job classes return from trials, but get a much, much bigger overhaul than before, and it's thanks to the elemental vessels. And these are artifacts that can house elemental powers, and allow the users to access the jobs, as well as open up new things, like changing your fighting styles, like Val either being a swift swordsman, a great sword wielder, or a paladin with a lance and shield, or help. Take Palomena for example, where she can range from being a mace wielder, a scythe holder, or even going toe to toe with her boots. And you also have the elemental plot, which is this game's skill tree and allows for new special moves, combos, and new class abilities, as well as magic, and also among a special move called the elemental break. Though a little bit more on that in just a bit. Among all that, you also have ability seeds. And these grant you bonus effects, whether it's either new abilities or just passive ones later down the line. And speaking of later down the line, you'll also be able to get items that will increase your ability slots and will able to even have an item that will reset your entire build if you're not entirely satisfied. And you're able to get elemental points from leveling up, finding gold clovers that convert into points, 
or especially if your elemental points run out, or even crystals that will give you more once the elemental you have is obtained. And what's great is that even though certain elements and moves are based on the vessel classes, there are some moves like elemental magic, depending on the elements, that could be transferred to your other classes, especially with the aforementioned ability seeds. The room for customizing your character and build is essentially limitless and adds a whole new layer of depth. Furthermore, these vessels you obtained aren't just for show, though if you ask me they look really my fabulous, especially Mole and Palomina. Yes, queen, slay, slay, slay your enemies! As these vessels also have ability that works for both combat and exploration, the form of which ranges from things like Luna's Globe that slows down time to stop enemies and speeds your character's movements, to Sylph Boomerang that sends a little tornado to bounce enemies for aerial combos, or even Undine Flask that acts like, say, a Nerf water soaker. I mean, what else does it remind you of? It's Nerf for nothing! <laughs> and that allows you to trap down enemies and spray them with water damage. And there's also defensive options like, say, Gnome Shovel that provides a shield. My shield! My shield! My shield! My, my shield! shield! Then you have Dried Spring that provides a healing spring, and all of these are really fun to use. Now, sure, each of them do provide a cooldown when you activate them, so you don't, so you can't be able to spam them really nilly. Though some lay down the line are faster than others to recharge, so that does help. And we then go on to the elemental break. After unlocking it, a golden bar will appear on the left, and that bar will be increased every time you use an elemental's vessel during combat. And when that bar is full, instead of pressing the R2 button to activate the general vessel ability, you hold it for a while, and seeing this animation change will release the elemental break. And this will not only light up the field with the surrounding element for a short period of time, but your characters and movement speeds are increased up to tenfold to a point that you will zip and attack nearby enemies at the speed of sound. You also even get effects based on the vessel, like earth throwing big rocks at enemies, silver being able to blow bigger tornadoes, and shade that will suck enemies to black hole chan and explode. And then not only that, but during the elemental break you can also use the vessel's normal ability as well, which is also really nice. Among that, Returning from Charles and Minor Remake is about a bonus system, and it gives you bonus effects after ending the battle, depending on what you do, like gain more lucre and XP if you end the battle in either 30 seconds or less, take no damage, or defeat an enemy with either class strike or elemental break. But combat is half of what this game truly offers, as the exploration is also what's key here, and how to save. I was really amazed on how vast this world was. Now, it's not fully open world like say a Final Fantasy VII Rebirth or Elden Ring or even Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, but still it has a good balance of sublinear, with its world design being similar to Dragon Quest XI and Tales of Arise and Granbo Fantasy Relink. And not gonna lie, it's that stuff, but I eat that <laughs> up. Some good food. The levels themselves have a vast array to explore. Where it's things to find chests, items, more enemies, as well as elemental crystals that will grant you points, and meridians that serves at this game's classic manual saves, as well as fast travel points. And don't worry, there's also an auto save. As well as parts where you can use the elemental vessels, as not only are they used for combat, but also for exploration and dungeon crawling and puzzle solving. Where you even come across them needing to progress and find something special, and these vessels have various effects, like Sylph Boomerang creating a gust tornado for you to propel in the air, or even creating floating platforms for you to jump on. Then you have Lunar Globe that slows down time to slow down speedy ice platforms, 
or even reverse time to already open chests that you haven't unlocked. Then you have an undimmed flask that can swim through bubbles, salamander candle to ride on this missile candle thing. And no, don't say what it looks like to you. Please don't. Penis. And you ride into these fire waves right here, like your bullet bill on Mario Kart. Among also my favorites to be using are the Shade Side, where it serves as your grapple hook, and you have Luminal Lantern. And it's basically where you help find these devices that will help illuminate invisible platforms and entry points. The addition of the elemental vessels for exploration was a good call, and lets this game stand out among the rest, and provides a brand new mechanic and evolution of puzzle solving that's not in a way boring or annoying to do so. I also do like on how it's used for secret paths for exploration, and how there are points for early levels, reserved for later vessels that you have to obtain through the story, that gives you something to think about when revisiting past levels. And these vessels help provide some truly, truly amazing dungeons, something that I think most modern RPGs have now abandoned by. Now, it wouldn't be a mana game if it didn't have a companion for you to travel for the terrain. Like with Secret and Trials of Mana, the Vuskav and Flammy return to fill their respective roles, form of which is being used for water and the latter one being used for air. Though, we have a brand new addition for general ground movement, and that's the Pickles. These cute and fluffy giant dogs that you get to ride on and to speed through areas and essentially, they serve as both the chocobos of this game, really. As you're able to ram through enemies, which is always funny, not gonna lie. And they're just so damn cute. But even without them, the general exploration as well as running speed and movement is really good. And the same goes for the combat. Now we get on to the bosses. And just like with the remake of Trials, the bosses here are aggressive and have the usual red MMO-like attacks that give you ample time to avoid their general attacks, but also have various weak points that are resistant or weak to a certain element, and should they be destroyed, they would deal massive damage. Now that's a lot of damage! Anywho, not only that, but it can also deal a lot of damage that some of them will be knocked out or even staggered for just a bit. And while some are on the spongy and annoying side, <coughs> vampire, a lot of them do serve as a good test of skill for your mechanics. My favorite bosses in the game would have to be the Mantis Ant, Zenoa, who's immediately a step up from Charles of Mana remake in every single way, as well as the Benevodons of Light, Water, Fire, and Wood, as well as the main antagonist. Now overall, the gameplay is really good, and just like with the Charles of Mana remake, I think this is easily the best combat of the entire series, as it even iterates and takes ideas from that game and truly makes it stand out among the rest. But even so, it's not without its flaws. One instance that I think is really bad about Visions would have to be the camera. And I'll be real here, the camera in this game is really, really, really bad. To the point it fluctuates with the lock-on system during battles, and it can't be even bothered to focus on the enemies, and for some reason it either zooms out way too much where everything else feels so tiny, and doing bosses, especially when some of them have like jars that can refill your MP, HP, and your CS gauge, trying to attack those jars has the characters missing it and locked towards the enemy. Another issue I do have is the party AI. Now, for the most part, it's competent, but at times, there are instances where characters, even when you do tweak the settings, would do dumb things, like running towards AoE attacks. I wouldn't say it's the worst party AI system, but man, oh man, is it frustrating. Another issue I do have is that some characters would have input delays with casting spells, as even times when you activate it through the ring menu, it just there's no response out of it, and it just feels so damn odd. Another gripe I do have is the negation of elemental breaks and vessels. What do I mean about this? Well, it's when your bar is full and you try to activate it, 
but when you do get attacked, that bar is gone and your break or vessel ability just didn't happen. And honestly, it's just dumb. And while I did give praises for some of the bosses, there are some bosses that do drag out a little bit and have some annoying gimmicks. The vampire one easily being the worst boss in the entire game. Fucking guy. And my last gameplay gripe of the day would have to be the exploration gameplay and how the free-flowing excellent gameplay is immediately cut off when you go into towns and it feels just so odd and limiting as a result. Like all the freedom you had in exploration is cut out when you go into towns. Honestly, I don't know why they altered it like that. But aside from those flaws, the general gameplay of Visions is really good. And sure, it's not the fastest combat out there. And honestly, it's a pretty fun battle system. And it definitely clicks. The amount of customization, depth and fun. And I know some were really put off by this game by its demo. But honestly, the full game itself does a much better job of handling the battle system. And honestly, I feel like this game, the full game, does a better job of what the demo set out to do. It honestly takes what's good about prior minor games and improves upon the Charles of Mana Remix combat and has its own spin to stand out. And then we come to the music. And yeah, it's a banger. With having the all-star cast of composers, like returning composer Hiroki Kakuta from the original Secret of Mana and Charles of Mana, and from the remake of Charles, we have returning is Ryo Yamazaki and Tsuyoshi Sakito, and they all do a good job of composing the soundtrack for Visions of Mana. All of it is damn amazing, with having lots of great magical themes throughout the story, especially through the funny and emotional moments, as well as both the town and exploration themes being just both comforting and atmospheric. But man, what really goes hard would have to be the battle and boss themes. Some of them even blew me away, especially the fights against the Benevidons. So, without further ado, let's link into some bangers. And then we come to the content, and man is this game truly jam packed. First off, we have the side quest, which is a brand new thing for the Mana series. Well, outside of Legend of Mana, and it's boring, completely boring. If there was a brand new addition that Visions introduced that just did not work at all, it would have to be these, as they are just your typical fetch side quests. Outside of that, we have the lesser elemental and greater elemental areas. 
the form of which are many gauntlet challenges that include timed mod fights of their own respective elements. And if you can survive and beat them in time, you get a reward. As for the greater ones, they're much more bigger and provide more challenging fights. After completing the game, you get not only a new game plus mode, but also a brand new difficulty called Extreme. There's also of course a brand new post game chapter with tough new super bosses, including a familiar favorite. A decent playthrough throughout this game can take you around, say, 30 hours. But if you do everything, you're bound to get at least 40 to 60 hours, which for a game like this, especially for a minor game, is meaty. That's quite big. Impressive. And with that, how is this game? Is this game truly worthy of being a mainline mod title and on par with the classics of old? Well, easily, yes. Visions of Mana is easily, without question, my favorite in the series. Everything that was built on from the last games, including the remake of Trials, has culminated in a great game. The visuals are fantastic, the story was surprisingly good, with a well-defined cast of characters, the music is superb, and the combat really took the best elements of both the Trials of Mana remake and even aspects of the original Secret of Mana, while adding its own twist, which makes this game feel like an evolution and the right direction for the series. It really felt like the team, especially the Mana team, went full steam ahead on every level. And while it's not perfect, as it does still have flaws, this was still an experience I will never forget greatly. And having played the mind games beforehand, well, almost all of them, this truly felt like a reward. Overall, I'll give Visions of Mana 4.5 pickles out of 5. Now, while this game turned out to be amazing and even had some solid reviews on launch, sadly, its fate was premature. At the time of this video, the studio that made this game, Oka Studios, was immediately shut down by NetEase during the game's launch, which is really tragic. And the sales of this game, especially in Japan, haven't been doing well, given the fact that there's no Switch version of Visions of Mana. And with things like the recent restructuring of Square Enix, with them prioritizing AAA titles and multi-platform forward, even slowly breaking down the barriers of having more in-house development than outsourced, the future of the Mars series is up in the air. So it's hard to see if a new game will be made. I wouldn't say it's entirely impossible, as even the remake of Trials was done by a different studio, even the same one that gave us the recent Romantin Saga 2 remake, and if this game would even get a Switch 2 port. Maybe from a third party studio that does things like say, Virtuals that handle the Switch version of Platinum Games is near Automata, and whoever the team that poured the Charles of Mana remake to Xbox recently. But alas, just like with the future of Star Ocean, all we can do is hope for the best, that the team of Visions can migrate to a place where they can still make another banger Mana game that truly takes the best aspects of Visions and cuts out what was wrong with it. Only time will tell. Anyway, that'll be it for me, so let me know in the comments if you guys played this game or not. With that, my minor journey has ended. Thank you guys so much for watching my long review journey of these entire games. They were absolutely amazing and a wonderful experience to have. And until then, Mad Kaiser, out.